tonight on Praise from Palm Beach, Florida. New York Times best-selling author and Bible teacher, Joyce Meyer. And now, Matt and Lori Crouch. We are in beautiful South Florida. We are here in Palm Beach. Joyce Meyer, we um, have a very important subject, healing the soul of a woman. I've married to one. <laughs> I've been married to her for 33 years. It's an important subject to me. How are we going to unpack this and what, what exactly are we talking about? Well, I'll probably tell a little bit about my story, but I think so. First of all, I don't even know how many people know what their soul is. Mm. Your soul is your, it's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so it's all about the, the way you think and the way you feel and the decisions that you make. And so many people look great on the outside, but they're carrying around a lot of wounds on the inside and they always show up the most in relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that have been hurt by someone are abused or rejected or mistreated. They end up not liking themselves. And if you don't like yourself, you can't get along with other people. So you're always trying to get them to fix you. You want them to make you feel good. And really the bottom line is, is nobody can do that yeah. except God and he will, but you have to let him. You have to get into agreement with him. You know, there's so many components to this, and to be honest, if somebody is wounded real deeply in their soul, it's not something they're going to get over overnight. Mm -hmm. There's going to be studying the Word and obeying God, and, you know, some people need some counseling, but there's, there's nothing better than being healthy on the inside. Mm -hmm. And the best gift, really, that you can give anybody is a healthy you. Yeah. Because to be married to someone that's all broken inside that you feel like you have to constantly be careful and you know, like you're walking on eggshells and you can't hurt their feelings and you can't confront them about anything and you know they're moody. I, I remember my husband saying I used to drive down the road at night thinking I wonder what she'll be like tonight. Oh wow! And that's sad. Yeah. You know? And uh, but I'm evidence as well as lots of other people that you certainly can be healed. It it requires facing some truth. It requires not blaming your behavior on what happened to you. It requires not feeling sorry for yourself. There's, there's one chapter in the book that I wrote that uh, says no parking at any time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that a lot of people do is they park at the point of their pain and they never go past that. Everything in their life from that point on is colored by what happened to them and the pain that they had. And we don't have to live like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's let's an important just, issue. <laughs> yeah. Let's just start by saying uh, when, when Joyce Meyer, the author of 121 books, wants to tell you something for free, you ought to listen to it. So we welcome you to this beautiful setting. And behind you, Joyce, I'm distracted by the beauty of the waves and the water. And this is really the ocean. This is not a set. Uh, this would be the Atlantic Ocean. I live near the Pacific Ocean, so this is the Atlantic. And we are talking about healing the soul of a woman. And the first comment I got about the book from Joyce, I just think it's my prettiest book I've ever written. It's true. You know, it is it's just pretty. Was talking about that. And I would think uh, people would want it just to <laughs> I know, to sit on the put shelf. Put up on the shelf. Just to look at it. That's right, but the inside Read it. Is okay. <laughs> so, the, uh, a few years ago, you wrote Beauty for Ashes, right. okay? And how is this the deeper dig? Because uh, it's a similar subject matter, yeah. if not the exact subject matter, but it's deeper. How is this book different than Beauty for Ashes? Well, first of all, I have 25 more years experience mm. <laughs> than I had when I wrote Beauty for Ashes. And I've dealt with a lot of different people and dealt with myself over the years. And so it, you, you said it, it's, it's a deeper dig. Okay. It goes deeper and shares more of what I've learned over the years, which has been a great deal. You know, yeah. the good thing about God is we never stop learning and I still Occasionally, we'll see things crop up in me that I know are a result of the abuse I had in my childhood. But the thing that I say now is I can, I don't have to just react. Hmm. I can act yeah. on what I know God has told me. 
had you learned a lot? Were you surprised by, I mean, did you read Beauty for Ashes again? Because that told your personal story, a lot of your personal story. So how many years has it been since that? Probably about 25. 25. Were you surprised at how far you'd come, even from that book? Well, I, when I think back the way I was, I mean, there's no telling, honestly, how many times I would have been married and divorced mm. wow. if I wouldn't have let God work in my life and heal me. And uh, that's what happens to so many people. They just go through one relationship after another after another. And of course, the first time I got married, I married the first guy that came along because I really thought nobody would ever want me. And I knew down deep inside it was a mistake because he had even more problems than me. And sadly, that's what a lot of times hurting, wounded, troubled people marry other Attracted. hurting, troubled mm -hmm. people. And I, I say jokingly, but it's true, they give each other trouble and then they have kids and dump all their troubles on them and then mm -hmm. it just goes from generation to generation. But you don't have to live affected by your past. God says we can let go of the past. And of course, the first thing, and it's probably the hardest thing, is you cannot go forward until you forgive. Yeah. Wow. And that's, there's so many people, so many Christians that are still mad. And I mean, I could go just about anywhere and do a sermon on forgiveness sure. and ask how many people still needed to forgive somebody. And there's gonna be 80% of the people hmm. that lift their hand. And I, I read something yesterday, I heard this, actually it was in a show I was watching on TV, but I thought that is a great statement. He said, you're never any weaker than when you're angry. Wow. Or when you're angry, you're weaker than at any other time in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think Satan just uses anger and strife and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness to just keep, up, keep people in prison. And I always say, what's the point in being mad at somebody that's out having a good time and don't even care that you're upset? Yeah. Right. So you're really just hurting yourself. So everything God says about forgiving people it's really like you're not doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. You're doing yourself a favor mm -hmm. when you forgive. And then when you do that, you release God to deal with those people. And it is a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's not something you feel. It's a decision that you make. And God says plainly, you pray for them, you bless, and do not curse them. Mm -hmm. And so most people just try to not feel bad about a person that's hurt them anymore. And that's not even the point. The point is, is to make the decision to forgive with God's help. And then when, when you start praying for somebody, you can't main, you won't have bad feelings toward them for very long if you really pray for them. And I think that's what people don't do. Yeah. They don't pray. And we think, well, I don't want to pray for them to be yeah. blessed. I don't want them to be blessed. But the first thing God will start blessing them with is truth. There it is. <laughs> yeah. And so we get all mixed up. Well, I don't want them to be blessed. Well, I understand that. I didn't want my enemies to be blessed either, but then God showed me the first thing I can bless them with is truth if you pray for them. And God's our vindicator. We can't vindicate yeah. ourselves. I heard a definition of forgiveness, and I, I want you to correct it or add to it, um, that you don't care anymore whether or not the person or people face consequences for what they did. I, I do think when you, when you totally forgive, and I might even say I think maybe the total forgiveness comes in degrees. You know, I've, I said the official I forgive you prayer, you know, yeah. because I knew that God wanted me to. Mm -hmm. But I still did not want to, uh, the bless your enemies part, was not something that I was too interested in. Mm -hmm. And I only saw my mom and dad when I absolutely had to for the shortest amount of time that I could see them. But as they started getting older and less able to care for themselves, you know, God wanted me to do what the Bible says to do, mm -hmm. yeah. which was take care of them. Well, I didn't want to take care of them. I mean, I didn't even think it was fair for God to ask me. And my first thing to God was, well, they never did anything for me. Wow. And uh, he said, well, you are breathing, so, you know, at least they, they gave me life. They yeah. put clothes on my back and sent me to school. And uh, then taking those steps of obedience to move them closer to where I was and 
made sure they got to their doctor's appointments and make sure their grass was mowed. And I didn't have the time to do all that because of being in ministry, so it ended up costing a lot of money that we didn't have at the time. But ultimately, my dad ended up getting saved mm -hmm. through the love that we showed him because he knew that he did not deserve it. Wow. And the Bible tells us to do that. Why? To show that we're like our hev Heavenly Father. He never, God never asks us to forgive somebody else for more than what he's forgiven us for. Wow. 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 Okay. That's true. Healing the soul of a woman. We're going to dig into it here in just a second. I just want to ask you kind of a, a, the overview question. If somebody goes chapter one all the way through, really reads it, what is your hope for that person that takes the, the book serious and ingests it, lives it, what it, what's the result? What, do you, what, what journey are you taking someone through in this book? Well, what I would hope is that initially, you know, like pretty soon, they would get some real revelation about, you know, the kind of life they're living compared to the kind of life that God wants them to live. You know, it's like I used an example about some of the equipment that we have today, like your phone or your computer, you know. There are so many things that I could do on my computer, but I won't take the time to learn how to do them. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I fumble through sometimes and make a project harder than it would have to be because <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to learn how to work this stuff. Well, you know, what kind of a life did Jesus die for us to have? What, do, do you want to have the best life you can have? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to just be a Christian who goes to church every week and, you know, maybe does a few, try to do a few nice things, but you're just miserable on the inside all the time? You know, it's one thing to be a miserable sinner. It's another thing to be a miserable believer. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't die so we could just limp along through life. I mean, he wants us to have a great life. And so that's one of the one of the chapters up in the front is, you know, living the best life that's available to you. And so I just said that, you know, to come out with a new phone, I mean, you can't even hardly get used to the one you've got and they've got a new one, but everybody wants to get the newest upgrade. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we want to get the newest upgraded life that we can have? People stand in line all night to be the first in line to get some kind of an upgrade for their phone, but we don't want to put in the time and the effort to upgrade mm -hmm. our life. And so I would hope that people would see, well, there's apparently a lot more available to me than what I'm experiencing in my life. Mm -hmm. And they would just say to God, I want what you want for me. But it's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be comfortable. Yeah. And it's going to take time. So I would hope by the end of it, people would be ready to start on a journey of healing that requires different things for different people. Like for some people that may involve some professional counseling. For some people it may involve being in a recovery group. You know, for some people it may be just telling somebody what happened to them. So many people that have been sexually abused spend their whole life and don't tell anybody or somebody maybe who's had an abortion and they're still hurting from that. They don't you know, our secrets make us sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things that you hide on the inside and are afraid for anybody to find out, they keep you in fear. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's more painful? I think, I think people get stuck because they think, man, if I tell anybody and if I start talking about this and facing my reality, mm -hmm. my past, it's going to be pain all right. over again for me. How do we get past that? Well, I say there's, there's two kinds of pain you can choose. You're going to have some pain either way. It's either the pain of getting free, yeah. <laughs> which ultimately leaves you without the pain, or it's the pain of staying the same way that you are the rest of your life. So that's something that... Two big fears. Yeah, I would yeah. really like the viewers to <laughs> think about what I just said. Yeah. Do you really want to stay the same as you are the rest of your life. Hmm. I mean, is that really what you want? Or do you want to change? 
And, you know, most people are going to say, I want to change. But what they want is they want God to change them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And something that I've discovered, Matt and Laurie, just really a lot in the last couple of years. I don't know why it took me this long to know this as long as I've been preaching. But we, we say that we want things, but we don't want to do what we need to do to get them. Wow. And so... We want a shortcut. We want a shortcut. And so, but this is what I've, I've discovered. We pray for God to do things. And, but what he almost always does is he'll show you what to do. Mm -hmm. He'll show you what's wrong. Or maybe, maybe like you'll start praying, well, you know, how do I get rid of this? Well, you need to tell somebody. Well, no, I don't want to do that. So you just stay messed up for another long time. You know, I, I had a woman at a conference one time. This will get the point across good. <laughs> it was a conference uh, where we were serving meals, and so everybody was at tables, and I think there were like tables of eight. And we were teaching on this type of healing type thing. And a girl came to me at the end, and she said, well, I found out what my problem is. And I said, well, good. What did you find out? She said, I sat at a table with eight women. All of them had similar stories to mine. And she said, every one of them are healed now. And I'm still just as big a mess as I was in the beginning. And she said, here's what I discovered. God has told me to do the same things that he told all them to do. The only difference is they did it and I didn't. Wow. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Healing. The soul of a woman. Wow. Joyce, I have a, just a simple question. On a scale to one to ten, at your early years, how screwed up were you on oh. a scale to one to ten? Uh, Twelve. Okay. <laughs> so, and the the fact that you're now, uh, you know, how many years in ministry now? Yeah, 42. 42 years in ministry. Mm -hmm. Healing the soul of a woman. Guess what? We've timed the airing of this broadcast and this book is available right now. Go to Amazon or wherever, however you buy books. Uh, go to the bookstores that you buy books in. Oh, Healing know. the Soul of a Woman. It is out now. We are discussing it now. It is available now. Healing the Soul of a Woman uh, by Joyce Meyer. And like I said earlier, when, a, when somebody that basically has written 121 books digs in this deep. This is really your journey in a lot of ways. So where do you want to kind of dig in here and what nuggets can we pull out right here on this broadcast that can help people? Well, I'm just looking at one of the chapters that says, help me, I don't understand myself. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Even, even most people with a healthy soul don't understand themselves, yeah. let alone somebody that's all messed up because you don't, I mean, I, I thought all the time, what is wrong with me? Wow. Because I would, I would do things I didn't want to do, say things I didn't want to say, react in ways that I didn't want to react. And so much of it was coming out of my past pain, but I didn't know that. So I'll give you an example. I don't, I really understand why Jesus used parables. I can't hardly preach without giving examples and telling stories. I think we, the word is very, it's so practical. It's not over our heads. I mean, Jesus made it applicable to everyday life. So in the earlier years of mine and Dave's marriage, like a lot of young couples, it just seemed to me that we couldn't talk about anything if there was any kind of a conflict. If, <laughs> if he didn't agree with me, then then you'd both be wrong. Well, I didn't even really realize what I was doing, but I couldn't separate me from my opinion. I didn't know who I was. Oh, wow. So if I had an opinion and he didn't agree with it, then I would feel rejected. So then I would go into this mode of trying to convince him that I was right. So then he felt manipulated mm -hmm. and controlled and like the only way that he could get along with me was if he always agreed with me, which then, so my dysfunction uh -huh. took away his freedom. And I mean, when God finally showed me that, I was like, my gosh. You know, I just, 
It was rejection. It was that root of rejection that I had in my life from my past. And so if, if, I, if I cooked a meal and it wasn't his favorite, I felt rejected. Mm -hmm. If he didn't agree with my opinion, I felt rejected. If he didn't like an outfit I put on, I felt rejected because I didn't know who I was. I was all these other things. I was the way I looked or I was, you know, the way I cooked or, you know, everything, everything had to be compliments and I agree with you and you're right. You know, when you, when you feel so wrong, you want somebody else to constantly be telling you that you're right. And sooner or later, people are going to get tired of keeping you fixed because that's all they can do all day long is make you feel good about yourself. Can I um, use you as a referee just for a second? Sure. And just, I want to remind you that, I want to remind you that there's cameras here and that we're yeah. recording. <laughs> we so go. I just want to, you, you know, um, uh, let me tell you kind of the opposite of what you just said uh, that might happen once in a while <laughs> is, if, I love when we play this game yeah, with you, don't but, you? But, and you have to be nice because you, you don't yeah, do. But referee, referee this, because Lori would never try to convince me she was right. She would clam up and probably feel a level of rejection that I didn't see it the way she did or whatever, but she would never try to out-verbal skill me. Fight with it. Yeah, yeah she would just clam up and, and kind of go. So... You are a verbal communicator, so you I'm were not. trying, she would be the opposite of that, but it's a si very similar thing. If we ever get in, a, in any kind of a disagreement over, for goodness sakes, the color of a candle, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, then she would, she would probably just clam up. So that'd be the... Well, the, see, the I explode and she implodes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But both yeah. are equally destructive. But I'm right, right? He's always right. That's the problem, Joy. <laughs> well, I'm all, just trying to get you to say I'm right is all I know. All men are always right. <laughs> there you I, go. It's like, oh, it's, there's it's the like, Instagram quote. There yeah, it is right it's there. It's like, at least they think they are. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, right. They've got a little revelation come out when they get to heaven. <laughs> go ahead and uh, bring that. <laughs> yeah. I told Dave the other day, I said, you know, when you get to heaven, <laughs> you are, you're going to be a little bit bored because the rest of us are going to know everything we, that we've never known. You know, the Bible says you'll know even as you're known. But I said, you already know everything. <laughs> so there will, there's going to be no nothing. No surprises for you. For you. <laughs> there's going to be no surprises at all for you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, What's funny? Yeah. You and Dave are just yeah, such good I friends. You. All right. Let me, let me, let me. You know, the way that we respond to things are partially dependent large part dependent on our temperament. Mm -hmm. Like okay. I know a woman in ministry who was also abused sexually by a family member like I was. And I came out of it like, you know, a bull in a china cabinet. Yep. And she shrunk back mm -hmm. within herself and wouldn't ever confront anything. And they're both equally destructive and they're both equally wrong. Because if you do what you've done, you end up letting people walk all over you all the time because you, you won't speak up for yourself. You won't take up for yourself, and you need to do that. I was on the other end of the extreme where, I mean, I confronted everything. Mm. You know, no, no right timing, no right place, you know, no doing it quietly or privately. I was just like, if I felt it, out it came. Yeah, see, I love to watch that. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that, you know, we, we have to learn to understand where some of this behavior is coming from. Yeah. And something that is amazing to me, it's amazing what God will tell you if you just ask him. Wow. Why, yeah. why did I do that? One night I was tossing and turning and I couldn't sleep and I usually sleep pretty good. And I don't know why it took me till 5 a.m., but finally at 5 a.m. I said, God, what is wrong? And immediately he showed me that I had really hurt somebody's feelings the day before and never bothered to tell them I was sorry, mm. never repented for it. And as soon as I did, I went to sleep. But I didn't get an answer until I asked. You have not because mm. you asked not. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking God what's wrong with everybody else, mm -hmm. we need to start asking him. We need to start 
owning our reactions to things. Yeah. Not just not just blaming, <laughs> but owning our reaction right. to things. It's when you when you stop making excuses yeah. for all your wrong behavior. Yeah. I mean, things start to change pretty rapidly. But it's you know, Jesus said the truth will make you free, but it's not the truth about somebody else that makes yeah. me free. Wow. It's the truth about me. Good point. Yeah. That makes me free. Where else do you want to uh, go here? What else do you want to unpack? I love what you said. You said true freedom is inside of us, not right. around us. Yeah. I love that part. There's so many There's so many, so many good things. One of the things that was extremely helpful to me as far as forgiving is God told me hurting people hurt people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so most of the people, you know, if, if you're watching and you've been really hurt by somebody, they hurt you out of their hurt. Mm -hmm. And if you realize that, then it does make it a little bit easier to forgive them. My father had not been raised right, and there was incest in his home, which I found out later. And he wasn't treated right by his dad. And his dad was a Christian, and yet he was a mean Christian. Hmm. And that doesn't always set well with the people around you. And so he, he was already had two strikes against him when he started. And that doesn't make what he did okay. Right. But it does make it easier to forgive if you realize that people are, are hurting you out of their own pain. And then another chapter in here that I really enjoyed preaching this message was no parking at any time. Okay. One day I was driving down the street and I just saw this sign, no parking at any time, and it just like exploded into me. I thought, that's what people do with their life. They park at the point of their pain and they don't go anywhere else. And I happened to see a, a movie, I don't know if you ever saw it, it's about, um, I think it's called The Yellow Van or something. It was, mm. And this is actually a true story. It was about a woman who was homeless and she lived in this yellow van that she had painted yellow. And she, they kept running her off the street. She'd park on the street and they'd let her stay there so long. So finally she went to this person's house and asked if she could park in their driveway for a certain period of time because she found out she could get some uh, some money from the government monthly if she had an address, but she didn't have one. So he didn't really want to do it. This actually happened over in England, but he let her park there. Well, she ended up staying there for like years and years and years. But the, the ultimate, I mean, it's a long story, but to get to the long and the short of it, she was a, a concert pianist She'd prayed, I mean, played before kings and queens and was just phenomenal. She really, really, really loved God. So she became a nun and she happened to have a mother superior that was not very kind and was really jealous of her piano gift. And so she told her that God wanted her to give it up because it was prideful. And so that hurt her so bad and the way they treated her hurt her so bad that she ended up leaving and having some kind of like a mental breakdown. And then at one point in her life, she had hit a young man in the street and killed him. And so between carrying the guilt of that and what had happened to her, she ended up being homeless and living in, living in her van and of course, this, this part of the story was fictional, but when she got to heaven, the first person, she died in her van, by the way. We, you know, you die where you park. Yeah. And so she, uh, first person she saw when she got to heaven was this young man that she had blamed herself for killing all these years. And he said, you didn't kill me. I stepped out in front of your car on purpose. Oh my goodness. And so me being abused, I carried the guilt of that. I thought, well, what's wrong with me that my father wants to do that to me? And how many people, somebody else is dysfunctional and they're hurting you, but I mean, how many women whose husbands cheat on them think it's my, well, it must have been my fault. Yeah. You know, I wasn't pretty enough or I wasn't this enough or, I, you know, the devil always wants us to think we're not enough. Yeah. And that's why people mistreat us. And I just don't want to see people just park their life 
at the point of their pain and stay there the rest of your life, living some kind of a half-life when Jesus died for you to be made completely whole. And this whole thing about the soul being healthy, I mean, the things that happen to me and the things that happen to other people, it affects how you think. That's why the Bible says clearly that one of the first things that has to happen is you have to learn how to get your mind renewed through the Word of God. Like, you know, the devil told me all my life, what's wrong with you? Well, the first thing I study is righteousness in Christ. Yes. So the enemy wants to remind us daily of everything that's wrong with us, but the Bible says, he that knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And so the more you think you're wrong, the more wrong things you'll do. But the more you believe that you're right with God through Jesus' sacrifice, the more right things you'll do. Mm -hmm. God never expects us to do anything without giving us the equipment to do it. So he forgives us first so we can forgive other people. Right. He's merciful to us so we can be merciful to others. Yeah, he, he loves us. us. that ability. Yeah, so we can yeah. love other people. Yeah. And so he never asks us to do anything that's not going to be for our benefit. Yeah. So even when something is hard, God's trying to set you free from something that's going to be much harder if you keep it. Mm -hmm. So that to me was a really important chapter in the book because you, ha you have to, you know, you have to make a decision that you're going to put your life in drive again and stop just blaming everything on what people did to you or what happened to you. We've heard it said um, similarly that the point of your pain will either be your prison or your platform. That's very good. And uh, we are unpacking Healing the Soul of a Woman with Joyce Meyer. This is about her 121st or 22nd book. She is a number one New York Times Amazing. best-selling author, and we are unpacking her latest book. Okay. More important. More, let's keep going. What do, what do you want I wanna... know you've got things that you love to preach out of this book. Well, I mean, I want to hear question. what you guys have to say, too. Okay. okay. A, a psychologist once... Uh, that you interviewed one time said that a woman needs to make peace with their thighs. <laughs> you can explain that. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> well, basically what she was talking about is you, you have to get around to the point of accepting yourself yeah. as you are before you can make any progress to be any other way. Is that yeah. like number one, point number one, of what we have to change to go to be healed. People want people want this. We want our emotions and our spirit and our our mind to be healed. What's the first thing that we need to do probably besides just renew your mind with the word of God and I'm the Well right the first to... thing is is you need to receive Jesus Christ as yes, your Savior. Okay, that's right because you can't you know yeah. you can't do this and do it right yeah. if you don't have him helping you and living on the inside of you to begin to reveal to you and show things to you. You know, having a relationship with Jesus isn't just about, oh good, I don't have to go to hell when I die, I get to right. go to heaven. Right. He died for you to have a great life. Right. Yes. And I would say that the, the next thing that has to happen, Laurie, is you have to recognize that you have a problem. That it's not everybody else that has a problem. See, I thought everybody else had a problem. <laughs> I thought, what's wrong with Dave? What's wrong with my kids? What's wrong with my neighbor? What's wrong with my parents? It was always somebody else. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. And I remember an experience I had when I was, I was praying one day for Dave to change. <laughs> and I mean, I was going after it. I, I prayed loud and long and, oh God, you got to change Dave. You know, I'd lay down on the floor on my face and get real dramatic. <laughs> God, you got to change Dave. I can't do this anymore. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, Dave's not the problem. Oh. And I honestly thought, well, who is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, show me, Lord. <laughs> I couldn't even conceive that it was me. I had lived in <laughs> denial. <laughs> I had lived in denial for so long that I thought, well, if it's not Dave, who is it? Yeah. And God spent the next three days revealing to me what it was like to live in the house with me. Oh. Wow. And I cried for three days oh. because I, I mean, it's hard. It's hard when you start 
having to face that, you know, I'm selfish and I'm jealous and I'm self-centered and I'm mad if I don't get my way all the time. But each one of those truths that you face then gives you a little bit more freedom. You cannot be healed from a problem until you first own the problem. Got it. And so how long is that going to take people? I don't know. I mean, So that... the first thing <laughs> is don't do it alone. Do it with Jesus. Right. Second thing is admit that you have a problem. What's right. the third thing? I well, want to get this out because you, know, you we're all. You have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then so, there's Dave. <laughs> then there's number three. So what's number three? What's kind of the next well, progression? Well, th there's one chapter in here about finding your path. Yes. And the thing is, is the Holy Spirit will take over your healing. If you mm -hmm. ask him, I need you to heal me. The great thing about putting the Holy Spirit on your case is he already knows more about you than you'll ever find out. And he knows exactly what it takes for each person and exactly when the right time is. Hmm. You know, like I might confront somebody about something too soon. I'll give you an example. I was counseling a woman one time and she had just received Jesus, but she was living with her boyfriend and had been for a long time. Well, she was in my office for counseling and I was already planning what I was gonna to say to her while she was talking and I thought, well, I'm gonna tell her that she's gotta, you know, she's gotta put an end to this relationship. She can't be living in that kind of sin and expect God to help her. And the Holy Spirit clearly said to me, you're not gonna tell her that. Wow. She's not ready for that. When the time's right, I'll tell her that. And see, I think even in dealing with people, wow. we want somebody to get saved last night and we want to sit them down today and, them and tell them all the mm -hmm. things now they have to change. Mm -hmm. But maybe they need to be loved on yeah, by absolutely. God for six months before they can do any of that. So the Holy Spirit knows mm -hmm. exactly when wow. and exactly how. That's amazing. Yeah. Right? And so I was married to Dave for several years, probably five or six years. And we went to a church service where there was a woman giving her testimony that night that had been sexually abused by her father like I had. And she had written a book. And, um, I, you know, I wasn't gonna buy the book. I mean, that, that, that wasn't my problem because I thought when I got away from my father that I got away from my problem. Uh, okay. Mm. But see, I didn't realize I took it with me in my soul. Mm. And that's what so many people think. They think, you know, I'm out of here. I mean, I had my plan. I'm out of here. Nobody's ever going to tell me what to do again. I'll never trust anybody again. Nobody's ever going to hurt me again. And so I had all these inner vows, all these promises that I had made to myself to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't really let anybody even in. I wouldn't let anybody get close enough to even take a chance on hurting me. And so I, d I didn't really realize how many problems I had. Well, Dave bought me the book, and he gave it to me, and I, so the next, I mean, I remember I was sitting, and I opened up the book, and chapter one, page one, this girl's describing the abuse in detail and some of the things her father did to her. I mean, the pain that came roaring up out of my soul, I took that book, and I threw it across the room, and I said out loud, home by myself, I will not read this. And the Holy Spirit so sweetly said, it's time. Wow. So he knows the right time yeah. and the right way. And so when you decide you do want to get well, you need to first ask the Holy Spirit to begin to guide you down the path that he has for you. Like I said, maybe for some people, that's going and talking to your pastor. Maybe for some people, that's joining a a group at your church that deals with these kinds of issues. Maybe it's going for some professional counseling. I didn't, first of all, I didn't have the money for professional counseling, but I mean, I received my healing from the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that I'm against psychology. I think it can be very good, but that's not the only way. You don't have to always have that to get it because what is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit? He is the counselor. So he can show us what to do. And I can literally say that for me, 
when the Holy Spirit took, took over my case. He just began to show me step by step. You know, I, and, and the mind was a big thing for me. Thus, I wrote Battlefield of the Mind, which mm -hmm. is still our, probably our number one book. And my thinking was so messed up. I mean, it was just, I, I let the devil lie to me for years and didn't even know he was doing it. So wow. I learned that I had to compare my thinking to what God's word said. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I heard nobody loves you, nobody ever will, I had to say, no, that's not true because God loves me and he always will. Yeah. And so uh, I can't give, I can't say just like step one through 20 for everybody because God's going to do it in a different way. But in reading a book like this, I think this is like a manual for um, the healing of the soul. Yes. One chapter in Here's the Wounds of Sin. See, some people are watching today and you're not hurting. You don't have a wounded soul because somebody did something to you. You have a wounded soul because of something you did. Hmm. <laughs> and so that person then needs to realize that there's no sin they've committed that cannot be forgiven. There's nothing in their past that God cannot heal and redeem. And redeem. That's very important because God will take the most awful thing we did and if we let him actually turn it around and work it out for our good. So all the things that happened to me in my childhood, I know this sounds dumb, but I can't even say now that I'm sorry that they happened. Wow. I used to say, well, if only that wouldn't have happened. If it wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Wow. And I wouldn't know some of the things that I know. Yeah. I went through a very difficult situation at a church that I worked at one time. So many painful experiences. But I learned more out of that about leadership than I could even begin to tell you because I didn't learn what to do, but I sure learned what, what not, not to do. do. There you go. Right. <laughs> yeah. You said, I thought that when I got away from my parents and your, specifically your father, that I didn't now have any problem. Right. But you had carried it in your soul. soul. Right. So you didn't even realize that. So this book and the healing of your soul is super important because most, it, let me just say, if you had written the one, you know, healing the soul of a man, you know, you know what would need to be the first thing is logistically, if you're away from the problem, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, because that's just the way, you know, I mean, we fix it, right? You get yeah. on a, you move across country <laughs> if it was a bad relationship or, yeah. see, in my mind, that would have fixed it totally too, mm. also. Right. I mean, maybe we think similarly, but ultimately, that is, that's why this book exists because you drug everything in your soul and didn't realize it. Right. Okay. Geographically, you don't get away from the thing. The Holy you, Spirit you has to take fix it. With it. You. Yeah. yeah. You take it with you. You carry it with you in your soul. By the way, I've told men all you have to do is put a piece of tape over the W O, <laughs> and I admit it's a little bit of a girly cover for a guy. <laughs> but if you can handle a book with a rose on it, I mean, it's act. I mean, the same thing works for yeah. men. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, Got there it. are more women that are wounded in their soul than men because... About like that? Yeah, that's okay. right. See, healing the soul of a man. There you go. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you're real secure, you could have a book with a pink rose on it and it wouldn't bother you. you or you it. could take it off and have a purple book. Yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> Got it. I love the, the, the chapter about um, being your own best ally. Cause yeah, so that's, many of that's us actually what just, I was going to okay, talk about. Let's you got to... that one. I you, love that. You got to be your own friend. Yeah. You know, be a friend to yourself and do things for yourself. Yeah. You know, I love that David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah. You know, we're always waiting for somebody else to tell us we're okay. Well, you can get that from God. If, if you will learn to believe, if you'll just learn to believe what God says about you, you know, like, I like myself. And I know that under normal circumstances, that would sound really haughty and like I was just full of myself, but Jesus died for us. Beautiful. And really, I think it's almost like a slap in his face 
to hate yourself or be against yourself. I mean, the Bible says you, you don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. And the price that we were purchased with was the blood of Jesus and all the pain and suffering that he went through. And I like to be, I like to spend time alone. I like to spend time with myself. And a lot of people, they've got to have noise going on around them all the time. They've got to have the TV on. They've got to have a bunch of people around them all the time. And some people are just, you know, social butterflies. That's part of their personality. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people stay too busy to have to deal with themselves. Wow. They just go from thing to thing to thing so they don't have to really face themselves. But you need to become a friend to yourself and don't always be waiting for somebody else to do something for you. If you don't have anybody that's doing something for you, then go do something for yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know, do something that, it, I just think that's important because you know, most people really don't like themselves. I mean, if you get right down to it and I found out that was one of the things the Holy Spirit showed me is, you know, you don't, I, I couldn't, I was a very unmerciful person, very legalistic and, I mean, I would have made a great Pharisee. I mean, I was like, you know, you had to do it my way, my time, and I wasn't giving in. And when I started really praying about, God, I want to be merciful to people, but I just don't seem to be able to. And what he showed me is, well, you won't, you don't know how to receive mercy. Mm. Wow. And you can't give away what you don't have. Yeah. That's been like a big thing for me with God is you cannot give away what you don't have. And he will equip us to do everything he wants us to do, but we get it from him. It's like if we receive it from him, then we've got it and we can then release it and he gets the credit, we don't. And Our so, time together uh, with Joyce Meyer healing the soul of a woman, and if you do this right here, it's healing the soul of a man, <laughs> um, is kind of winding down. Um, we've got about five minutes left in this broadcast, and what I would love to do, um, Joyce, if you would, just two things, kind of how do we kind of put a, a nice little kind of conclusion on this and, and pray for the audience that they would be able to hear what's right for them right now because of that timing thing. I mean, you've, you've really drilled that down that there's a, there is a rhythm to what we're supposed mm -hmm. to do and that one size does not fit all. No. Um, and so just kind of take, uh, take yeah. kind of put a little bit of a wrap up on this, a bit okay. of a prayer and then, and then kind of get your final thoughts. You have to realize that Whatever path God takes you down, and I can't tell you what that's going to be. I can tell you that he's faithful, and he will not let you down. If you ask God to help you in this, and you're willing to do what he shows you to do, then you will make progress a little bit at a time. Why a little bit at a time? I don't know, but God doesn't get in a big hurry about things. He <laughs> takes his good old time about almost everything that he does, but when he does something, he does it right. Yeah. And so going into this, you have to make your mind up. This is not going to be a quick fix, overnight, drive-through healing. And if your soul is right, if your mind, if you can think properly according to the word, if you can own your emotions instead of letting them own you, you're always going to have feelings, but the difference is you don't have to always act on every feeling that you have. And if you can make willful decisions according to the Word of God, no matter what's going on outside in your life, you may need money, you may want to be married and you're not married, you may have people that you're dealing with that are difficult to deal with, you might have a tough job, you could even be in prison, but if you're right inside, then you can be happy no matter what is going on around you because your real life is in you. Hmm. It's not your circumstances. Your real life is in you. So please, please give God a chance. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that everybody watching who has a wounded soul will let you in, that they won't hold any doors closed, no secret places anymore, that they will let you in and that those who have not received you as Savior will 
call. I'm sure the number that's on the screen right now, pray with somebody or pray themselves, repent of their sins and ask you into their heart. And I pray that you would begin a healing in them that would just completely revolutionize their life. And I pray for them that they won't give up until it's completely done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Healing the soul of a woman is what we are discussing and unpacking. And um, I'm going to ask you a question and uh, answer it. Uh, um, in case we even have to edit something else, because yes, I, I, I want to I ask you, because it feels like what the takeaway for me is, is that the, the Holy Spirit and your healing is, first of all, work. Mm -hmm. We always want God to do something for us or to us, mm -hmm. and we don't want to just do the hard work and get fixed. So um, I was watching something not long ago, and I heard this term, same-day seed which seemed to be, you know, uh, uh, trying to shortcut something and, you know, give now and there's the same day seed yeah. and, and, okay. So that is not what you're talking about. And I don't think that's reality. It's okay. Not. That, those kind of statements actually really aggravate me yeah. okay. because it, it, it's like telling somebody when they receive Christ that that's the end of all their problems. Yeah. Mm. That is just absolutely not true. I tell people there's no guarantee you won't have problems, but if you have Jesus, you never have to deal with them alone. Right. There you go. You always got somebody to help you. Right. And your your best day, your worst day with him will be better than your best day ever was Amen. without him. Yeah. And uh, it, one of the chapters is called The Painless Path. And we all look for that. But there is no such thing. You know, Jesus walked a path of pain and, you know, there's a broad path and a narrow path. and if you want to live on the broad path, which ends in destruction, you can kind of find a way to numb your pain or you can drug it away or alcohol it away or sex it away or whatever you think you do to end it, but it's still going to be there to haunt you hmm. when you're by yourself. And the thing is, is you, God will do this in your life, but it is work. And one scripture makes that very clear, Philippians 2.12. Work out your own salvation mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. <laughs> Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while at work in you. So it doesn't say work for your salvation. That's a free gift. So God downloads at our salvation everything into our spirit that we need to live an amazing life, but it comes in seed form. Yeah. Jesus is called the seed, capital S, of God. <laughs> and so... It's like you become pregnant with godliness mm. when you're born again. But you have to wow. carry those seeds. You water them with the word. You let God get the weeds out of your life. And we become like his garden, and he's the chief gardener. And so you, you let him do that, and you work that out. You let it be worked from in you, out through your soul, and then eventually things like this, like we're doing right now, now you have a changed life and people see that and they're like, well, it has to be God. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, it has to be God. Absolutely it's beautiful. Help everybody. Same day C would be reaching in the ground, pulling the same seed back out. That doesn't even make any <laughs> sense. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, doesn't even make any sense. I got it. <laughs> healing for the soul of a woman and healing the soul of a man <laughs> is the Goes book. Hand in hand. And uh, we've been unpacking it with New York Times number one best-selling author, Joyce Meyer. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you so much for having me. And what a beautiful place. This is uh, Atlantic Ocean over here. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>